Sadness and outrage tonight after another school shooting in America. Good afternoon, this is News 2, and we're following a breaking story today of shooting at a high school in Littleton, Colorado. There is word potentially multiple children have been killed. This happened at the Robb Elementary School in the Uvalde Consolidated Independence School District. 12 Colorado movie theater massacre. Seven bodies were discovered in Oklahoma. Two mosques in Christchurch were targeted, the country's worst mass shooting ever. Hi everyone. I truly hope you guys are enjoying the little Halloween series I am doing. I've had to keep the cases kind of short in order to have the time to complete so many in a short amount of time, as well as continuing my normal videos. However, this last one will be a little longer, so please stay tuned. Thank you for sticking through. As always, I do my best to fact check all information. Sometimes sources can report inaccurate information, and while I strive to weed it all out, it is very possible that some may have made it into my videos. If so, I dearly apologize, and please feel free to correct it in the comments. Also, I want to remind everyone that the cases I cover are true and involve real people. You guys are usually great about keeping comments respectful, but there are always the bad apples that comment something extremely insensitive. With all of that out of the way, I really do hope that you enjoy the video I have for you today. Napa, California is known for its beautiful scenery and tolerable temperatures. Napa is part of the California wine country, and it's home to a plethora of vineyards and wineries. Multiple sources state that at the time of this case, in 2004, Napa was considered a safe place to live, with violent crime not being a common occurrence at all. In fact, according to ABC.com, the town hadn't seen a murder in more than two years. But that streak was shattered, when just hours after three friends were handing out Halloween candy to innocent trick-or-treaters, a violent attack occurred in the safety of their own home. In the early hours of November 1, 2004, housemates Adriani and Sognia, Leslie Mazzara and Lauren Mianza were sound asleep in their beds after a long night of Halloween festivities. They all went to bed around 11 p.m. that night. The three young women lived on Dorset Street in Napa, California, and had been living together for only a few months at this point. All three girls got along well and didn't mind sharing a home with each other. In fact, they liked having each other around to talk to or hang out with if they were bored. I want to talk a little about each of the three roommates, as well as the important relationships they had going on in their lives at the time of this story. Adrian Michel Insognia was born on December 30th, 1977 and was 26 years old during the events of this story. She attended local schools in Calistoga, California while growing up, and always participated in her school's athletic teams. When she was 16 years old, she was involved in a near-fatal car accident. Apparently the car she was in had rolled three times, and Adrian actually hit her head on the pavement through an open window as it rolled. She miraculously survived, only left with some memory loss as a result of temporary brain damage. She stayed a few months in the hospital, but immediately excelled in school again when she was finally discharged. Adrian ultimately graduated from Calistoga High School in 1996. She attended California Polytechnic University on a scholarship, completing her bachelor's degree in civil engineering. After graduating, she settled in Napa, California, where she landed a job at the Napa Sanitation District as an assistant engineer. She continued her hobby of participating in sports, playing volleyball and softball in her new city. Adrian had a lot of new relationships formed during this time. Shortly after being hired for the city, she met and started dating a man named Christian. Their relationship was reportedly unsteady, with them taking multiple breaks during the duration of their relationship. Adrian was seeking a long-term commitment, but Christian wasn't ready for something so serious. Adrian also met a woman while working for the city of Napa, named Lily Prudhomme and they reportedly became best friends. Lily was engaged to a man named Eric Koppel, who was also a part of the friend group. The two of them would go over to Adrienne's home to see her, but Lily would also often go by herself to hang out with Adrienne. Just four months before her death, with her best friend Lily, Adrienne celebrated the 10-year anniversary of surviving that fatal car accident. To Adrienne, that day was, quote, the day she was supposed to die. I couldn't find too much of the second roommate, Lauren Mayanza's background, but from what I could find, 
She was an extremely talented athlete who graduated college with a political science degree. According to Medium.com, she was employed as a volleyball coach at a community college during the time of the case. Adriana and Lauren were friends prior to renting the house together. In early 2004, they found the house on the west side of Napa and decided to become roommates. Adrian's best friend, Lily, and her fiancé, Eric, joined them for a small impromptu celebration following their move. Now onto the third eventual housemate. Leslie Ann Mazzara was born on August 1, 1978 in South Carolina. She was also 26 years old at the time of this case. She was extremely friendly and outgoing. She was said to have never met a stranger. Leslie was raised on a farm by her single mother, alongside her two half-brothers. She was known around town as a beauty queen, competing in and winning the Miss Williamston pageant. She even later competed in the Miss South Carolina pageant. Leslie seemed like a very sweet person, even raising money for the Calvary Home for Children in order to open a safe house for abused children to live in. Leslie attended college, and I saw that she was stuck between becoming either a teacher or an attorney, but had no clear path ahead of her. Other than this, I wasn't able to find a ton of information about this time in her life. But I do know that after she graduated, Leslie was still completely undecided about what her next steps in life should be. At one point, her mother traveled to Berkeley, California, and told Leslie that she could spend the summer there, working in wine country. Leslie thought this idea was worth exploring, so she flew out to California and was hired on the spot at a winery owned by the director of The Godfather, Francis Ford Coppola. After all, her outgoing and bubbly personality was a great fit for the position. When her mom eventually returned home, Leslie decided to stay in California. Leslie found a home to live in. It was in a quiet and seemingly safe neighborhood. This home, as we know, already had two occupants, Adrian Insonia and Lauren Mianza. She moved in and had only been sharing this home with the other two girls for a few months before the events of this case. She was popular, and that didn't stop when it came to men. According to two of her friends from South Carolina, Leslie was seeing two men at the time. She was described as a heartbreaker, but unintentionally. She was truly a sweet girl, and never intended to hurt anyone she came into contact with. Leslie remained on good terms with everyone she had dated in the past. I assume she just wanted to test her options and was less focused on being in a long-term relationship. Leslie, though, was reported to be quite serious about the younger man she was seeing during the time of this case. Apparently, the older of the two men found out about the other and was described as being incredibly furious. It was not the first time that a man was infatuated with Leslie. In fact, she had received multiple gifts from her prior admirers. She was at one point sent on a cruise by a boyfriend. Another one bought her a brand new set of luggage. She was even gifted a car from another. Anyway, her past relationships aren't the point really. I'm just trying to illustrate the amount of people she had been with. How many men might have had their heart broken by Leslie, even if it was unintentionally? Back to the setting of the case. In 2004, the girls spent their Halloween night handing out candy to trick-or-treaters before heading to bed at 11 p.m. Leslie and Adrienne retreated to their bedrooms on the upper floor, while Lauren returned to her own bedroom, the only one on the lower floor of the home. In the early hours of November 1, 2004, at around 2 a.m., Lauren woke up to her dog barking. Lauren then noticed that the exterior motion sensor lights were on, but she dismissed this, assuming it was Adrienne's cat setting them off. After shushing the dog, she slowly started drifting back to sleep. She was awoken again, this time by the sound of someone entering the house and heading upstairs. Lauren assumed it was the man Leslie was seeing, who had come over just a few nights prior. Three days before, both Adrian and Lauren were kept up late into the night due to noises coming from Leslie's room. Fearing this night would produce the same results, Lauren was debating on confronting the couple, as she was annoyed yet again at being woken up so late. However, she said that she didn't want to be a spoil sport, so she let it go. Lauren, again, began to drift asleep, but she was yet again woken up. This time, it was a sudden and piercing scream coming from upstairs. Now wide awake, Lauren crept to her bedroom door to investigate the commotion. She stuck her head out of her bedroom door, attempting to locate the source of the startling screams, which were now replaced with pleas for help. 
She was frozen in fear as she stood looking out of the doorway. That was, until she heard thundering footsteps descending down the stairs towards her. She later said, quote, He was just flying down the stairs, breaking stuff as he came around. Lauren fled out of the back door, terrified that whoever was running down the stairs was targeting her next. She was met with a tall fence, impossible for her to scale, so she did her best to hide in the backyard, listening intently for any noise caused by the unknown person. She heard what sounded like someone messing with blinds somewhere inside of the home. Then, it got eerily quiet. The sound of someone upstairs pleading for help was the only thing Lauren could hear at that moment. Unsure of what to do, Lauren Mianza very bravely made her way back into the house, not knowing if someone was still in there, and definitely unprepared for the extent of the scene she was about to stumble upon. When she got inside, she continued to hear cries coming from the upstairs room belonging to Adrian. She quickly made her way upstairs to investigate. When she approached and entered the doorway, Lauren saw her friend, Leslie Mazzara, laying on the floor face down on a pile of clothes soaked in blood. She was able to make out the numerous stab wounds inhabiting Leslie's upper body and arms. Her motionless body wasn't the source of the cries, though. Lauren scanned the room and saw her other friend and housemate, Adrian Insognia, crouched behind her bed. She was barely alive, bleeding heavily from multiple stab wounds. I saw one source say she attempted to render aid to both victims, slipping on the bloody floor in the process, but most just said she immediately called for help, so that's what I'm going with. Lauren wasted no time. She sprinted to the house phone, attempting to call 911, but the line was dead. She quickly moved on to another plan, running to get her mobile phone. Lauren was still unsure if an attacker remained in the house, and she was also terrified thinking someone may come back to finish them off. So, she made a split decision. As she dialed 911 from her personal phone, she ran out of the house and got into her car to drive away while on the phone with emergency services. Police and EMS arrived at their home on Dorset Street promptly, and there they found Leslie, already deceased at the scene. Adrian was shockingly still alive, but was fatally wounded, sadly passing away shortly after paramedics arrived. Both young women were stabbed viciously numerous times. Though Lauren could explain to authorities what she heard that night, she unfortunately never saw the attacker's face in the completely dark home, so she was unable to give a description of him to police. Police and forensic investigators combed through the entire crime scene, searching for any evidence that may lead them to answers about who committed this horrendous crime. 266 items of potential evidence were found and collected from the scene. These pieces included everything from the smallest microscopic fibers to cigarette butts found in the yard outside. None of the three housemates smoked, so authorities found it very likely that these butts belonged to the killer with him possibly lying in wait outside of the home before he began his violent attack. A drop of blood was also found outside of the kitchen window which had been broken, and authorities believed it may be the killer's. The blood was collected, and after the long wait for the testing to be completed, they learned that it contained DNA of a white male of probable North European descent. Upon a further look into the crime scene, investigators formed a theoretical timeline of events based on the evidence. According to authorities, they believed that Leslie was most likely the initial and intended target. As I'll explain in a few seconds, they felt that she had a much greater chance of coming into contact with someone that may become obsessed with her. It seemed that she had been attacked first, with the evidence indicating that she was sleeping as the attack began. Police say that Leslie then got up and ran to Adrian's room with the killer following closely behind. Adrian likely heard Leslie scream and ran to her defense, suffering fatal stab wounds in the process. The attack was personal, that was blatantly obvious. The killer had completely skipped Laura's room downstairs, seemingly heading straight for Leslie's room. Because of this, authorities wanted to dig into the victim's pasts to try and find anyone that would want to hurt either of the girls for any reason. Following the two murders, Leslie's computer was searched. An email from an ex-boyfriend was discovered, and while I couldn't find exactly what the email contained, I do know that it came from a man that had unsuccessfully proposed to her two years prior. He had been attempting to reach out to her again not long before she was murdered. Police thought that this man was a good potential suspect. He had been rejected by Leslie in the past, which likely would have made him angry, and he had just started to reach out to her again. 
I'll come back to this man in a moment. The residents in Napa were completely shocked after the news of this horrific crime broke. Like I said before, this area was renowned as being a safe place to live. Homicide was in no way a common occurrence in this seemingly safe town. After the murders, everyone was on edge, especially as days went by with no arrests made. People who previously left their doors unlocked at night were now barricading the doors as it got dark outside. Time passed, and people finally began to move on. In February of 2005, Lily Prudhomme, Adrian's best friend, finally decided to tie the knot with her fiancé, Eric, after Adrian's murder reminded her of how short life is. It had been a year of putting the marriage off at this point, and she just wanted to live her life to the fullest while she still had it. Adrian's mother attended the wedding, which featured Adrian's favorite song, She Will Be Loved, that they played in her honor. Unfortunately, it's common for rumors to begin to fly when questions go unanswered for long enough. One of the most repeated ones was that the three housemates were mixed up with some sort of drug problem. Many speculated that the murders were a planned and executed hit on the girls. Another popular rumor at the time was that Leslie's boss at the winery, Francis Ford Coppola, had mob ties. According to this rumor, the girls were collateral damage of some sort. Both of these rumors were based completely on speculation and had no factual evidence to support them. Back to the investigation, over 1,500 people were interviewed in connection to this double homicide, and over 200 DNA samples were collected. Unfortunately, even with the large number of samples given, they were unable to get a hit on a match. Police specifically obtained DNA samples from Adrian's current boyfriend, Christian, as well as the man that Leslie had previously been with, the man whose proposal she had rejected. Unfortunately, there was still no luck in finding a match. I didn't see if they obtained a sample from Leslie's current boyfriend, but I'm sure they did. The community was beginning to grow impatient and frustrated with the lack of progress in the case. Police turned their attention back to the cigarette butts found in the yard. More testing concluded that the DNA extracted from the butts matched the unknown blood found at the scene. The bud came from a camel Turkish gold cigarette, a type which at the time was fairly new to the market, so not many people smoked them. This revelation really had no effect on the investigation by itself. So about a year after the murders, authorities decided to turn to the public for assistance. They figured that since this was such an uncommon type of cigarette to smoke, surely someone would start to suspect someone they knew, and hopefully they would come forward with information. However, when someone did come forward, it wasn't how they expected it would be. Late on a Tuesday night, September 27, 2005, after detectives working on the case had already returned home for the night, a man named Eric Koppel showed up at the police station. Now. I'm not sure if you remember his name, but Eric was Lily Prudhomme's husband. Like the entire community, Eric had heard about the search for the Turkish gold cigarette smoker. And while he was there to give forth some information regarding it, no one expected for that mystery smoker to be turning himself in for the crime. Eric told the police that he believed he would probably be caught soon anyway, expecting someone to turn him in knowing he smoked the specific type of cigarette that police announced the killer most likely would. And so, Eric told police that he wanted to confess to the murders of Leslie and Adrian. Apparently he first confessed to his own family, and they in turn convinced him to go to the cops with his confession. They even accompanied him to the station. The entire community was hit with a mixture of devastation and shock. Adrian's mother was especially affected heavily by his confession. After all, she had just attended his and Lily's wedding in place of her daughter. I'm sure her mind was racing with all of the thoughts and memories from the wedding. That she had completely unknowingly been there to support the man that had so viciously and brutally stolen her daughter's life just months before the wedding. Another shocking piece of information came out shortly after Koppel's confession and arrest. He had never had a DNA sample taken. He hadn't even been interviewed in connection with the case. This came as such a shock, I think because he was so close to the case. I mean, he was literally married to Adrian's best friend. He had been to the house before and was considered to be in Adrian's inner circle. Apparently, at the very beginning of the investigation, police did attempt to contact him, 
leaving him voicemails which he conveniently decided to not return. They had never followed up with him after this though. The police chief came out and told the community that they would have eventually interviewed him and taken DNA, they just hadn't made it to that point yet. Unsurprisingly, after his eventual arrest, Koppel's DNA was taken, and it was found to be a match to both the cigarette butts and blood found on the scene. I was actually not really able to find much on Eric's background, which is usually not the case with killers. But anyway, Eric Koppel reportedly dealt with depression and suicidal thoughts his entire life. His method of coping was to drown his sorrows with alcohol. But what was his motive to commit double homicide? Well, according to Medium.com, Eric and Lily had initially planned to get married on November 1st, 2004, the day of the murders. Apparently before the set date, Lily had backed out of the wedding. Lily later said that topics such as their relationships would often come up when she spoke with Adrian. People speculate that Lily decided to call the wedding off following one of these discussions with her best friend. It's possible that Koppel found out that Adrian had a potential role in the wedding being cancelled, and he became furious. Not necessarily with Adrian, but definitely with Lily. However, Koppel didn't want to hurt his hopeful future bride, so he took his rage out on the next best person, the girl who potentially aided in shattering the wedding plans. It was perfect. He had been to the house before, so he was familiar with the layout, or so he thought. There was one variable he possibly wasn't expecting, and that was that the house was home to a third roommate. Many speculate that Koppel was completely unaware that three women lived in the house. In all likelihood, he only expected to have to take care of two women that night. Heartbreakingly, Koppel hadn't ever met Leslie, the second murder victim. She had absolutely nothing to do with his life seemingly falling apart. It's likely that he wasn't aware that Lauren slept downstairs, which is why he skipped it entirely, sparing her life. This begs the question though, if Koppel had been targeting Adrian this whole time, how did he end up attacking Leslie first? Was he in over his head, mixing up the girls' rooms, thinking he was entering Adrian's first? Or did he intentionally attempt to kill who he thought was the only other roommate first, so that he would have more time with Adrian? Whatever his reasoning was, Eric Koppel was formally charged with double homicide. His arraignment took place on January 11, 2007. Koppel pleaded guilty to both counts of first-degree murder. In exchange for not getting the death penalty, after speaking with Koppel's attorneys and the victim's families, Koppel was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He also waived his right to a future appeal. During his sentencing hearing, Leslie's mother made a statement directly to Koppel. She told him, quote, For the rest of your life, you and your family will experience what both your victims and loved ones have felt. Terror, desperation, hopelessness, violence. I wish I could tell you I forgive you. At this time, I cannot. And finally, I pray that never again will any mother's child grow up to be a murderer. During a three and a half hour hearing, Koppel apologized to the families of Adrian Insagna and Leslie Mazzara in a written statement. He told them that he had been suffering from depression in the months and years before the murders, which then caused him to abuse alcohol. According to Lily, in the days leading up to his confession, Koppel was acting strange. Lily told the court, quote, In the days before he confessed, I knew something was terribly bothering him. I told him, Eric, there is nothing in this world that you could do to make me love you less. Those words are just as true today as they were that afternoon. Lauren Mianza, the third housemate, has since been riddled with fear and lingering questions following the murders. She has a hard time understanding why Koppel didn't take her life that night. Why did she get to survive while her two friends didn't? I couldn't find exactly when she said this, but at one point she said, quote, Still, I can't sleep. Basically, it was a horror movie. That's what I thought. Exactly what I thought when I was up there. After all, two young beautiful women were taken from the world that night for no reason that makes sense. They were in the prime of their lives, and I'm sure they would have both gone on to do extraordinary things. The holes in their families' lives caused by these horrific murders can never be filled. They will never know true peace again. I'm thankful that Koppel decided to turn himself in. I'm glad that this case didn't end up as yet another unsolved case. It's likely that he wouldn't have gotten away with it forever, 
but I'm glad that he will spend as much time in prison as possible. Cases where a killer gets away for years, living their lives as normal always get to me, so I'm just happy that this isn't one of those cases. Please take a moment to remember the two beautiful women who had their prosperous lives stolen from them on that fateful night. As always, thank you so much for sticking through to the end of this video. I really hope you guys have enjoyed these daily Halloween-themed cases. Please let me know if you did, and I'll try to bring it back next year. I hope you all have an incredible Halloween, and I'll see you with a regular upload soon.